Thanks for joining us today on the Clark Howard Show. You know, our mission is to empower you with advice and information that you're able to use to make better financial decisions in your life. And one of the decisions I'd love for you to make is to sign up for our free newsletters, clark.com, clarkdeals.com, clark.com slash newsletters. We got to talk about something that is key to what a criminal does once they have key information about you, and it's called SIM swapping. What do you need to do to protect yourself? Coming up later, hotels more and more in the midst of a peak travel economy are in financial trouble. A lot going into foreclosure. And I want to tell you why you and I are affected by this. What about this is not good for you and me? What you got to know. So I mentioned on a prior podcast that uh, USA Today reported there were already over a billion of us caught up in data breaches just in the first six months of 24. So many different organizations. I mean, you, you probably heard all the noise about the AT&T one and the Ticketmaster one. And there have been so many others you never hear any noise about. Plus all the those lawyer letters you get saying, uh, it's come to our attention that we've suffered a, a breach of data and your information such as your date of birth, your driver's license number, your social security number, uh, your credit card number, blah, 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 are in this breach. And we get to the point where we're numb to it. But once a criminal has key data points on you, they're ready to pounce. And what they're really after um, as part of the process is your two-factor authentication, which most often will be your cell phone number. And so they will try to access an account of yours, and then it'll say, we're sending a code to you that you have to respond to in the next 10 minutes, and, and then you'll have access to your account. So what a criminal will do is they will steal your cell phone service often in the middle of the night. You'll wake up the next day and your cell phone doesn't work. You're like, what's going on? And it's that a criminal is uh, two-factoring on you. They're taking over your cell phone so that the code goes to them. So do you know it's really, really easy with most cell phone carriers, now even with many of the prepaid carriers, for you to put in place something they may call a SIM lock or SIM swap protection or whatever it is. Um, I'm with Google Fi, and in my Google Fi app, there's just a little button that I turn on that is SIM swap protection and there's a series of things that someone has to do. When I ported out from T-Mobile, I had to go through extra steps because I had SIM swap protection in place. The fascinating thing, though, you know how I'll talk about how for years and years and years, like nobody did credit freeze, and now credit freeze is more common? This is true right now with the SIM swapping because we're busy in life and it's like, you know, a lot of different things. And every cell phone carrier does the procedure differently. But if you were to go to the site of your cell phone provider or the app on your phone of your cell phone provider and you put in the search tool, uh, SIM swap protection or SIM lock or try different phrases like that, it will pop up and it will be an easy procedure for you to lock down your SIM. And what this does is that a criminal who's engaged in trying to steal your service, um, okay, I got to get down in something really down and dirty. And I talked about this either much earlier this year or last year, that there's been a scandal where criminals 
are paying people inside the big three cell phone carriers to port numbers out and they pay them a hundred bucks a port apparently and then they're able to go take over your cell phone service and get the two-factor done you prevent this by having the SIM lock or SIM swap protection or whatever in place because the cell phone carriers have not been able to prevent an occasional dishonest employee from being like a cancer on people's phone service porting it out. So this is important to do to set these protections in place. It's really quick and easy to do. Um, one other thing that uh, we've had so many complaints about is if you've paid off your cell phone and then you can't get the, the cell phone unlocked, meaning that then this is different than the SIM. This is where you can take your cell phone service and that phone you've already bought and paid for and go to any other provider. There are so many complaints that people have filed with the F Federal Communications Commission that the FCC voted unanimously to require cell phone carriers to unlock phones after 60 days to prevent this problem of the cell phone carriers trying to hold your phone hostage and prevent you from going to another carrier. This is going into effect barring lawsuits later this year. Krista? Okay, Kim in Massachusetts says, I re received a snail mail addressed to me from Ticketmaster slash Cyber Scout informing me of a data breach. I've never used Ticketmaster in my life and have to wonder if someone used my name and address illegally. I already froze my credit almost a year ago just as a matter of personal protection. Should I be worried about this? Of the things to worry about, Kim, I put this way down the list. Uh, who knows how you ended up on that list from Ticketmaster? And uh, your credit's frozen. No tickets have been bought on Ticketmaster using one of your credit cards that you're aware of. So I would rest easy on this one. Of the ones I'd worry about, this would not be high on the list. Tony in Georgia says, I was 32 days late on my credit union credit card. Uh, I never received any correspondence up until a phone call on the 32nd day. No email, no text. No phone calls or snail mail. I take complete responsibility for my non-payment. I always pay my balances in full every month. This is a back-of-the-wallet card for me, but as per your advice, I utilize it two times a year. Is there any chance that I can get them to not report this? I have a current credit score of 760, and I probably paid the balance on the card as soon as I found out about, about this. It was only $270. Please help me. Okay, so... Uh, first of all, thank you for your service. This is a military credit union. Make an appointment with the branch manager at the credit union and appeal to him or her and see if they can suppress this being reported to the credit bureau. Uh, doing it in, uh, I hope this just happened where you hit the 30, past the 30 day late. If you get in there in the same month, and meet with the branch manager, they can probably do this for you and it not report. Now, the 32 day late thing, uh, having a 30 day late, it will impact you uh, temporarily a meaningful amount of points and then the impact will steadily fade. If your score is 760, odds are you will maintain uh, a decent credit score going forward and then it will rebuild but still it would be much better not to have that 30 day late because a 30 day late freaks lenders out because they're worried uh oh maybe your financial situation's changed maybe we need to take a closer look at you maybe we need to scale back our risk with you so that's why if you can get this not reported it would be very much to your advantage um, this brings up a point set up with all your credit cards where they text you uh, many will uh, I think just about everybody will do this now where they text you payments due uh, many times they'll do it three days before the payments due or something like that to make sure that you don't miss 
a payment date. And people who were heavily in Google's ecosystem or ecosystem, echo, eco, whatever, um, Google has a system where they will alert you on when bills are due. It requires that you give Google permission to pretty much uh, review all your email and send you those notices, but you have to be willing to give Google that kind of power and information on your life. David in Pennsylvania says, I recently used insuremytrip.com to purchase trip insurance for a fall 2025 European river cruise. I noticed my policy provides 75,000 emergency medical and sickness coverage and 250,000 for emergency evacuation. Given this coverage, do we need to purchase separate, separate travel health insurance? In the past, we have purchased trip and travel health insurance separately. So, David, I mean, uh, first appearances in Europe, uh, it's different than the United States in terms of medical costs. Barring some kind of uh, tragic accident or uh, severe illness, severe medical event, 75,000 in the United States would be like uh, how many hours mm. in a hospital. In Europe, the money goes a lot further because the way medicine works in Europe, quarter of a million for emergency evacuation. I will tell you on the uh, emergency evacuation, you want to read that Insure My Trip policy to see does it actually allow you to go only to uh, an equivalent quality medical facility in Europe or would it actually allow you at your option to use that money to be transported to the United States. But uh, it's always a roll of the dice. A major medical event, even in Europe, 75 grand would not be enough. And if you're worried about the, the uh, tail risk, the, the wider risk on the curve, then you'd still want to buy a traveler's medical policy. And I hope that the river cruise is absolutely fantastic and that there's w enough water in the waterways mm -hmm. when you go next year because, uh, man, the river cruises have had to really adapt to the cycles of drought and flooding. And do you know what they do when, when there's too little water? What? They oh, put they you on a bus. You. Yeah, I've heard that. They, <laughs> they're able to lower the weight of a lot of these river cruise boats. And the boat can make it through without passengers. And they put you back on once they're past the area with the uh, low water levels. Definitely not what you expect when you book a river cruise, though. Well, Europe's beautiful from a bus, from a boat, from a bike. And what you did that you've never talked about on the podcast, Krista and her daughter Claire, mm -hmm. two years ago? Last year. Last year, went on an e extended extreme mountain climbing hike <laughs> through the Swiss and French Alps, is that right? I wouldn't call it extreme. We did like a four or five I day saw, trip. I saw pictures. You gotta be a jock to I do loved what, it. You, what I the loved two it. of you did. We went with a company, I'll name the company because it's not an endorsement, but they are a very good established company. It's not cheap, um, but they have different levels that you can do. But if you want an adventure trip in the US or abroad, Backroads is a California, it's a California, Berkeley, California, I think, company. And um, actually, the owner's neighbors were on the trip with us. And they take you, you stay in hotels, but you can do all sorts of things, biking, hiking, you know, walking tours. And um, we had a great time. We, we hiked around Mont Blanc. Um, so yeah, it was Was awesome. everybody on the trip in the physical condition, physical condition they needed to be in to be on that trip, or did anybody have to drop out during the trip? No, it was fine. Everybody was ready, and a lot of people had gone on multiple backroads trips before, and we really did stay in great places. They, I mean, I loved it for a group trip. It was fantastic, and the leaders are so fun. So it was, it worked out very well for us. I was so jealous of what you and Claire did. It was beautiful. Yeah, I mean, the, the pictures were 
impossibly good. Yeah, it was it was an awesome trip. Must be because you're on that Samsung S24. I guess that took so. All those great I guess pictures. so. That it was really a didn't splurge. look that good. The Samsung made it look that good. It was good. definitely a big splurge, though, Clark. I don't want to show you what I paid for it, but it was awesome. So much fun. Well, uh, it, it's funny because. There have been so many reports, like you heard about the thing in Barcelona where people are pouring water on tourists because they're just mm -hmm. tired of the tourists. And so many, uh, not, not necessarily Americans, most of the tourists are from elsewhere in Europe, but these cities are just completely overwhelmed with tourists. And then you went on this, this multi-day hike and it was completely, there was nobody around you all at all. It was, mm -mm. It was completely just so serene and peaceful and beautiful i'm yep. so jealous I, i'll have memories from that trip forever my daughter had already been studying abroad so i flew over and met up with her and we had this great adventure together and i'm so too cheap to pay for the trip you went on oh well coming up ahead speaking of travel i want to tell you there's trouble in river city in the hotel business and I want to tell you what you have to know so you don't end up in the middle of a disastrous stay at a hotel somewhere in the United States. So I travel a lot more than the average earthling. Um, probably 30 weeks a year I'm somewhere traveling. And that is that is very heavy rotation of travel. And I had anecdotally noticed and I've shared with you that the quality of hotels is completely not related to the name on the building anymore. And I've talked about the background, about why hotel chains are not enforcing standards anymore. And that's just a fact. And then you throw into the mix that so many hotels are in a heap of trouble financially and there are hotels being foreclosed on all over the United States. And you may wonder how? I mean, I've never paid this much for a room before. How are all these hotels going bust? So a lot of hotels have financial engineering involved in their purchases. And people are buying them and convincing lenders or convincing investors that they should borrow all this money to buy these hotels. So these hotels are weighed down by so much debt that even in a really strong cycle in travel, we're in a position right now that if you pull to an exit, and you know how hotels will cluster an exit, that out of every 15 or 16 hotels, one of them is in default on its lender loans. And all over the country, Hotels are in such distress, they're not fixing things, they're not replacing things, and the hotels are deteriorating, and they may look good from the exit, they may look good walking up if you're in a city and you're walking into a hotel, the pictures online may look good, and it may have a brand on it that you think, oh, this is going to be a great hotel, it's a so-and-so, ha, huh. means nothing right now what name is on that building means nothing. So the hotel industry, first, the failure to enforce any standards. Second, the loading up with debt. Third, is leading to a logical conclusion that the hotels are in a heap of trouble, which means you and I could book a place and we get there and it stinks. Then there's another problem. Remember I told you a story last year about how there were no employees at a hotel and people showed up to check in and there were no people there working at all and i mean that th everybody had quit i don't know if they weren't getting paid or whatever and that was the wild story if you remember because it became a big sensation on social media where one of the people who'd come in used to work in a hotel and went around and just started checking people in. <laughs> How crazy. So now more and more hotels are only partially 
staffed around the clock, that they no longer have people on the desk after a certain time of night or whatever. And you may get a weird message from a hotel saying, what time are you planning to arrive? And you might say, you know, should be there around 9.30 at night. And they'll send you back a message and they'll say, uh, sorry, there's no one to check you in that time of night. I mean, it is really severe right now. Think about one in every 15 or 16 hotels in the country it can't pay its bills. And so what, what do you do with this information? What do you do with it? So what I'm doing is when I'm looking to book a place, I'm spending a lot more time when I've narrowed in on a property I'm thinking of staying at, reading reviews. And because of the questions with TripAdvisor, maybe um, whitewashing reviews and removing reviews for hotels, I'm doing a lot more reading outside of TripAdvisor. And reading reviews, of course, I, I'll go to TripAdvisor, but I'm reading other places. And I'm looking at the recents because a hotel may still have an overall really solid uh, number there in terms of, you know, four out of five or eight out of ten or whatever scales being used. But a lot of that may be based on older reviews. I want to read what's happening there in the last six months. And over and over again, a hotel I was intending to stay at, I'm not staying at because of what people are saying about problems in recent times. I have a family member who got to a hotel recently, checked into the room. The room had not been cleaned, and uh, this is gross. There was blood uh, on the sheets and on towels in the room. And went back to the front desk, and this was the thing that really caught my attention. The person behind the desk was like, oh, really? Oh, let me give you another room. There was no surprise at all. And so just know that it's a sector of the economy that financial engineering is leading to a train wreck and you and I are the ones that end up in the train crash. All right, Jeff. Is that a bad analogy? Yeah. What All are right. you going to say? I was just going to tell a story, but... Please tell the story. I was recently at a hotel, and it was a cute place. Very, an Arab, It's like a bed and breakfast, not fancy. And we went to get the quilt out for the Murphy bed and out rolled a pair of boxer shorts that were <laughs> rolled up in there. So we didn't use the quilt. Okay. See, the good news, there wasn't a person that rolled out no, of the closet. No, that would have been worse. That, would that be some definitely kind of would have been much something. more scary. Yeah. Greg in California says, hey, Clark, I always hear you say to reshop your travel plans, such as flight, car, and hotel, to look for a better price as you get closer to the travel day. You also say hotels and such hate this. My question is, if they hate it so much, why do they offer such general, gener generous cancel cancellation policies that allow for this kind of behavior. Okay, so Greg, they're trying to change consumer behavior because the car rental agencies and hotels are now offering discriminatory pricing. So when you go to book a hotel, some now, because they hate it so much, are only offering non-refundable rooms. That's a high risk thing to book a non-refundable room, especially if you're not booking that the week of travel where the, there's near perfect certainty you're going. Uh, but most hotels are offering two tiers of prices. They're offering non-refundable rates that are lower, and you'll see this very heavily with any Marriott-owned hotel, that they offer you a better deal, they'll call it advanced purchase, non-refundable. And then they're offering a regular rate that by comparison you're like, wow, that's quite a bit more money. I pay, I book the quite a bit more money when I'm booking in advance because I want to be a free agent with the car rentals. I have never booked one of their non-refundable cars except, guess when? 
day of travel. Oh, yeah. I'll be on an airplane. And, you know, most flights now have the Wi-Fi. And I'll shop my car. And I'll see a deal where I'm landing, like, in an hour or two. And there'll be a non-refundable car rental. And it's, like, much cheaper than what I'd already booked. Then I'll take the non-refundable. But, yes, because of the fact they want you locked in, they do offer a better deal, but it's not worth it to me except at the very last minute. And the reason that they offer these deals is because they – To lock you in. Well, no, but I mean when he's saying, like, why do they offer these great deals at the end, I thought. No? Oh, why do they then offer lower rates Why do they let you have these generous cancellation policies that allow for the kind of behavior? Yeah, because most people never go do a re-shop. Yeah. But think how often – Travel will change. Um, another relative story, another relative of mine, uh, booked a non-refundable hotel because it was a cheap deal. And then the reason he was going on the trip got canceled and he ended up having to pay for two nights of a hotel he never ended up staying at. Mm. I do not like non-refundable. Kenneth in North Carolina says, I'm looking for a credit card with no foreign transaction fees and no annual fee for traveling when the risk of having the card info stolen is higher than normal. I don't want to risk having to close out a frequently used credit card due to this fraud. I have excellent credit. I have two credit cards already, and I want a card from a different issuer so I don't get the cards mixed up. Can you recommend a few cards from different issuers? Okay, so first things first, if you're worried about this, then you want to use, if you're an iPhone user, you want to use Apple Pay. If you are an Android user, you want to be using Google Wallet. When you pay through your phone, you're sending uh, one-time use unique codes. And when you send those, uh, even if a criminal intercepts, it's worthless to them. And that way you're not having to fret as much about card numbers being compromised here in the U.S. or overseas. You are right. There's far more problems with card numbers being compromised, it seems, when you travel overseas than when you're in the United States. But it's a a habit that I find that's hard for people to adapt to, doing tap to pay with a phone, But the security, at least for now, at least for now, is superior paying that way. As for having a separate card for international travel, I've got a list of no transaction fee cards divided two different ways. For people who travel a lot, no transaction fee cards that have an annual fee because of the various benefits that come with them. The other is no transaction fee cards with no annual fee. So you could have one that's a situational use card that you use just internationally. By the way, if you're traveling as a couple because of the possibilities of pickpocketing, which is probably a more common problem when you're traveling in a city outside the United States, what my wife and I do is we coordinate before we go on a trip and we parcel out and she'll take Uh, cards that I don't carry. I take cards she doesn't carry. So if either of us has our card number compromised or we're pickpocketed, that we still have cards we can use because of what the other still has. Smart. All right. This is from Thomas in North Carolina. My wife and I are planning on traveling to the western U.S. to see as many states as possible next summer. We are thinking of renting a small Class B RV to save money on hotels and meals. Would it be cheaper to drive our car and stay at hotels each night? Any advice? Thanks for your show. I listen to you each day at work. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thomas. Had to, had to read that part. Thomas, I've got, different, I've got a different comeback to what you asked in terms of is it cheaper or not uh, renting an RV. So... First thing I want you to do, if you've never been on a trip in an RV, I want you to test drive this. I want you to rent one for a three-night trip. 
where you go somewhere, you're in North Carolina, you've got uh, all the beautiful parks in North Carolina. You can go stay at a, at a uh, campground or an RV park for a few nights and see how it feels driving one instead of driving your own vehicle, um, how it feels staying in the RV versus staying in a hotel. And you will potentially save some money, but out west in the summer, the RV parks tend to run up their daily or nightly rates quite a bit. And so you don't save uh, as much pure money as you think you will renting the RV and staying in RV parks instead of staying in hotels. If you were doing it in the off season, because the prices are variable, if you were going on a, a trip in the Mountain West in, let's say, September, or going in May before the season gets really busy, June, July, August, then you might see enough of a price advantage, even though hotels would also be cheaper in May and September. But I think the RV parks run up so much in cost during the summer that the savings may be less than you think. But again, I would start by doing the test trip first, because you may say, I don't care how much money I'm saving. I hate this, or this is the greatest thing ever. We need to do this all the time. Uh, speaking of time, we're out of time today. But tomorrow, what's happening tomorrow? It's time for Clark Stinks, my favorite podcast and YouTube show segment of the week is hearing where I could have done a better job serving you. And how do we want to serve you? And everything we do, give you ideas that empower you so you save more, spend less, and avoid getting ripped off. And see you tomorrow.